Hello, Rejoice family and those beyond Re our Rejoice who happen to be watching this. As we uh, continue, it's hard to believe we're already on Thursday of our second week of this, um, this time in social distancing uh, due to the COVID-19 virus. And I think today is an appropriate day to talk a little bit about, about grief, but also about hope. And so I'm going to begin uh, with a passage from Isaiah. Uh, this is a passage from Isaiah 25. Uh, it's one of the passages you may have may know from Isaiah. It's a uh, passage of hope. So starting at verse 6. On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. He will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. God will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. So I know that uh, grief is not something that we often talk about except when we're talking about losing a loved one, but grief happens in all kinds of situations. You move to a new place. You grieve the relationships that you've left behind you graduate from from high school or from college there's excitement and joy about what the future will bring but there's also grief about the known which you're leaving behind the the familiar schedule of classes the uh the friends who will, you'll find out or who will be continuing friendships beyond that place but many of them will just be friends who you may see again at some point in the future but you're not going to see in the same way on a regular basis um, and certainly in a situation like this where the world around us has changed, there is grief. And so I know a lot of people are familiar with the, the stages of grief, you know, acceptance and denial and, um, you know, all of those pieces. I'm going to take a little different tact on grief today. Um, and I think it's a little more helpful tact than to be, just being able to say, well, okay, I'm in this stage of grief, you know, I'm in the portion of grief where I'm denying what happened. Or I'm the, in the portion of grief where I'm beginning to accept it, and I'm I'm the portion of grief where I'm overwhelmed by it, or I'm I'm sad by it. I'm going to talk about a, a task base, and this is a uh, approach to grief. This is something I learned from a colleague of mine, uh, Michael Gerlinghouse, uh, and so it's basically there's four steps to this po process of of walking through grief, and you're not all at one or the other at different points. So I'm going to talk about each of them. So the four steps are basically accepting the reality of the grief, of the loss. And then you have to process the pain of that grief. Then you begin to adjust to the world as it uh, as it's changed. You know, if it's, if it was, if it's sort of the loss, is learning how to adjust to life without that person there. Um, but if it's something like what we're all dealing with, you know, it's learning how to live in this new reality. And then the fourth part is finding an enduring connection with what was in the past for what's going to be your future and embarking on that new life. So this is kind of that, that process of reinvention. So again, the first part is accepting the reality. And I think that we are kind of coming to that point where we're accepting this is not going to be over, you know, next week that there are very significant things that we're doing for very good reasons. And, you know, part of the living in this space is making that best decision you can make at that particular time. You know, the reality is we do carry an emotional weight as we're trying to, to process and accept. Um, and, and it can make things harder and heavier and you're starting and trying new things. You know, uh, the reality of, you know, connecting with people virtually instead of physically, of, picking up the phone and calling people or uh, reaching out through email or doing video type things. In some ways, 
it's easier and in some ways it's harder. In some ways it re requires a lot more coordination. Um, and again, those are part of the changes that you make. And, and then again, there's just the reality of things that are lost, you know. I can speak personally, you know, the reality is that, um, you know, I lost uh, having my kids come down for their spring break. Um, I've lost one. I know I've already lost a second musical, uh, basically a date night that Chris and I go on uh, about once a month. We know that two of them have been canceled. One's already passed. One has already been canceled for the future. Um, you know, and there are other things that we know probably will be canceled. And, and those are hard. But you have to accept that this is the reality that we're living in. You begin to adjust to that. You begin to process the, the pain of what's happened. At the same time, you begin to move into um, that new reality. And so you do adjust to the world with, as it changes. I mean, and this is not something that's unique to this crisis. We do this all the time. Your ch health changes. Um, your, uh, and, and you aren't able to do things you once were able to do. Your um, relationship status changes. You find yourself, uh, you know, newly married or newly divorced. And you're having to adjust to um, to a new way of being, and you're having to figure out, you know, well, what does it mean that when kids leave for college, or when kids move back home, or when kids are born? I mean, all these different things. There is an adjustment to the new world and the way that that changes things for people. But I think probably the for me one of the most important pieces, and this is the the part that doesn't happen all at once. It's kind of this slow reinvention, is that that finding an enduring connection with what was before and moving into what's new. You know, make, making a connection with the past, but engaging that new future. That Again, sometimes that, that means that we reinvent who we are, what we do, how we interact with things. And for some of this, this is us, this is a process we do fairly rapidly. For some of us, it's a process that takes a lot more time. It's much harder. But the reality is, I think part of it is naming what you're going through. Naming that, you know, I'm trying to reimagine how do I do the work that I've done in a new way, at least for a time. How do I, um, how do I, how do I restructure my day if I'm at home instead of being in an office? Or how do I, um, and again, when you're doing this for a week or two, it's not a big deal. It's like, oh yeah, vacation. But most of us are beyond that point now. And we're having to figure out, well, what do I do in this time now? Um, and so again, I do think it's important to acknowledge these things. And and again, I'm going to share, again, this was written this morning. So this is one, one of mine, uh, and I'll share the link to it as well. This is called, again, kind of talking from this perspective of, of grief uh, from the, the reality we live in. This is called The Air is Heavy. The air is heavy as it fills my lungs with its leaden weight. For in the springtime of the year, in addition to the pollen, the heavy perfume of the earth reawakening from its slumber, the emergence of wildflowers and bees and leaves on trees, comes the weight of our fears over the death of the world that we know. While the rest of creation emerges from its wintry hibernation, we confine ourselves to our modern caves, repaying Sabbath to mist. While the bird songs fill the morning light, we sing a dirge. Like children caught between dance and death, we are unsatisfied. And we grieve the world transformed in ways we didn't foresee. The air is heavy as the alveoli slowly force it back into the sky above, breathing out the pain and the sadness, the life and the death, as each lobe automatically works to push the moist carbon dioxide through the bronchi and tracheae to be expelled out of the mouth, carrying on its respiration a heavy prayer for some lighter air. When we gathered in great numbers to sing and dance and jump, sitting at the banquet table, eating rich food and drinking well-aged wine, eating the marrow of life and drinking the wine strained clear, never thinking that death could swallow this up so quickly. And the shroud would lie over so many people from so many nations. 
the air that bears the lightest virus can seem so heavy as we try to launch our saline-filled cries up into the heavens, waiting, for the, waiting behind the high fortifications of our walls for the day when we can open the gates and joy a celebration and lightness, for the air is no longer heavy and we can breathe freely again, for the shroud has been removed and death is swallowed up, and prayers are finally answered as tears are wiped away. The city's life has been placed in a, the city's life which has been placed in a coma awakens as our lungs fill with a warm but lighter air of summer. So again, wherever you are in, in this process, wherever you are in accepting and um, processing and adjusting and, and reinventing things. You remain in my prayers. Um, I know that for some people you may need someone to talk to in the midst of this time. Um, if so, uh, reach out to me on email and we'll find a time that I can either talk on the phone or by video with you. Um, again, I'm trying to reach out to people as I as they come onto my mind or as, as I know that there's needs. Um, but you know, the reality is we're all doing the best we can. So give each other a little bit of grace. Uh, continue to keep one another in your prayers and we will get through this together there will come a day where we can regather and we can sing and laugh and dance. So that's all for this morning, and I will see you tomorrow as we uh, continue these reflections.